did grow up in Recording Canada. Recording in progress. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay, so a brief background. My name is Jason Koch. I grew up in Canada, studied engineering, uh, followed that with an MBA, and then moved over to the Middle East to work there for uh, a good while. And during that time, I, I had a desire to study in seminary. And so I ended up moving to Dallas to study at Dallas Theological Seminary. So I have a Master of Theology from that school and graduated a few years ago. And currently I'm in the third year of the Bible Exposition PhD program. So that's kind of where I'm, I'm coming from here. And what I would uh, love to present today is premillennialism and mistaken identities in Genesis 3 and 4. And I actually want to start with the conclusion because I, I've found that as I try to explain the, the process of getting to the conclusion, every trail I go on needs further explanation from other areas. So, so it's helpful to start with the, the conclusion here. And in general, Genesis 3.16 is translated this way, and I've just taken the NIV because that's the, by far the most popular English translation out there. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And my contention, uh, not mine alone, but uh, and I'll explain where this is coming from, is that a better translation would be, to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your sorrow and your conception. With sorrow, you will bring forth sons, and your desire will be for your man. And in this case, I'm saying the man is a reference to the promised seed of 315, because he will rule with you. And so uh, the big conclusion here is that the, the Ish, the, the man of 316, is not the man who's with her, uh, not her husband, because he's failed. Instead, her hope is now in the promised seed who will restore the rule of, of her and her husband uh, over the earth, uh, as it has just been given over to the serpent. And then this idea of ruling with you uh, implies that even though they've been promised death back in 2.17 and then reaffirmed in 3.17, they will have a resurrection. Uh, so, so I would argue from this verse alone, we're looking at a, a time in the biblical story that demands a resurrection and a rule with the promised seed uh, for those who hope in the promised seed. And very closely related to this is Genesis 4, 7. Typically translated this way, NIV says this, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Uh, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. And so notice it's taking the, the subject of desire here as sin, uh, as if sin is doing the desiring. Uh, but I'll explain later why that's not grammatically possible. And what we would propose as a translation is, if you do good, then rank or preeminence. And I'll talk more about that word and its meaning, how it's used. But if you do not do good, sin is a crouching one at the door. And for you, i.e. Cain, is his, uh, the serpent's desire, because Cain will rule with the serpent. Uh, and so... The, the big message here from 4.7 is that the one who desires Cain is not sin, but it's the serpent. And that the serpent will attempt to seduce humans to ruling with him against the seed of the woman and against God. And, and I think historically that kind of bears out. Uh, and that's why we have so many tyrants and, and terrible politicians, uh, al almost without exception. <laughs> uh, they rule the way the serpent does. Uh, so that's that's the conclusion. That's where we're going. Now, how do we get there? I'm taking a literary approach to the scripture. Uh, there's some lexical things we have to look at in terms of meaning of words. There's strictly logical uh, ideas we have to look at, like <clears throat> do the common translations uh, actually make logical sense? And then there's a historical element in terms of world history and uh, and how this works. So. Uh, so how do we get to this point? Well, uh, probably many of you have heard of Dwight Pentecost, uh, one of the legends around Dallas Seminary. And he 
really brought into Bible exposition this idea of a literary argument of, of a book. Uh, and for him, he was looking just at the individual Bible books. But his protege was Charles Bayless, who just passed away a couple of years ago. And Charles Bayless took that idea and expanded it to say, well, what if there's a literary argument to the entire Bible, uh, in which case we should be looking at it as a grand narrative. And he and his protege, David Klingler, uh, who is the current head of PhD studies in Bible exposition, so he, he's my advisor in the program right now, they uh, over the last 20 years have been advancing this thinking and saying, okay, how does narrative actually work? And how do we see this playing out in the scripture? And then from David Klingler to the current PhD cohort, so myself and my, my fellow student colleagues included in that group. And so, um, so I, I'm not alone in, uh, in, in thinking this way, uh, but I just want to explain kind of the history of how we got to this point. And so when we're thinking of the meta narrative of scripture, every story has a setting. And we contend that Genesis 1 and 2 provides the setting as the heaven and earth. Every story has a hero or a main character, the antagonist. And Genesis 1 to 2 would identify God. Uh, and from a New Testament perspective, we could look back and say, okay, that's God the Father, who is the, the hero. And his desire laid out in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, is that his image bearers rule the earth. And th that is a super, super important uh, passage right there, uh, those three verses, because that, that identifies the purpose of humanity, the purpose in creation, and what it means to be an image bearer of God. But every story also has a problem. And the problem is where something blocks the hero's desire. And in this case, the image bearers don't fulfill their purpose. Uh, instead, they give their rule over to the serpent, who they were supposed to be, be above all the animals, and they were supposed to rule them. And so now we have this serpent who is ruling the world. Uh, and then basically the, the plot of the Bible will revolve around how God the Father is going to resolve this problem of the serpent ruling the earth. And that will take place from Genesis 3.15 all the way to Revelation 19. And my, my contention is that the image bearers of God do not regain access to rule the world until Revelation 20, uh, what, what pre, uh, pre-millennial folks would call the millennial kingdom. Now, every story has a turning point. I would say that's, that's the cross. Uh, a lot of folks consider the cross kind of the climax of the story, but I'm inclined to say that's that's the point where where Christ is resurrected, and you can just kind of see the serpent going, uh oh, <laughs> we we know where where he you know he knows where his end is going to come, uh, when when Christ is resurrected, and and then the climax is where the the plot tension reaches its peak, and this is the great tribulation, and in that seven year period of the great tribulation, that's where the serpent has his image bearer, the antichrist ruling the world uh, in complete tyranny. And that's where he's in the, the temple of Jerusalem, uh, in you know the city of God being worshiped as God by the deceived people of God, the Jews. Uh, so it's a complete inversion. And that's why I would say that period is the climax of the story. Uh, because it's where the the tension is greatest things are farthest from the father's intention uh, for creation and then that gets resolved when christ returns revelation 19 and establishes his kingdom in chapter 20 and the image bearers once again rule the earth so with with this kind of in mind as the meta narrative um, i can then and move into uh, talking more about Genesis. Now, I, I just, um, Paul, I don't know how th this normally works, but would you like me to stop for questions at regular intervals? Can or you just me? go all the way through? Uh, and I still can't yeah, hear you, Paul. Can you, can you, can you hear Paul? <laughs> okay, okay. I can't hear Paul, but he, he typed in the chat, just go all the way through. So we'll... 
carry on. So if if we can say that there's narrative unity in the biblical me meta narrative, and I, I know that for this presentation that will sound like a presupposition, but that's actually a a conclusion that uh, I've worked through. And really, the bulk of the Bible exposition PhD program is defending the biblical meta narrative. So that's what we spend years doing, showing how all the books relate to this meta narrative. Uh, obviously, that's that will take too long. So for the purpose of this presentation, I, I'm assuming that. Uh, but just want you to realize that's a conclusion, not a presupposition. So it, if the whole Bible is a narrative unity, then we would expect the same of the individual books. And uh, taking Genesis as an example, this assumption of narrative unity directly contradicts basically what everybody out there is saying, and particularly the higher critical approaches. Now, higher criticism kind of coming to the forefront, late 1700s into the 1800s, 1900s, they come to the text with anti-supernatural presuppositions. They came applying the theory of biolo uh, biological evolution to text, <clears throat> which makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, so you end up with the, <coughs> excuse me, the graf Valhausen hypothesis for the composition of the Pentateuch, where they say, basically, it was composed by a whole bunch of people over different periods and times. And some redactor just stitched it all together. And it's this jumbled mess of, of nonsense. And they will come to the text saying, well, it, it can't have meaning as a, a narrative unity. It, it must be that we look at each section individually and find the meaning there. And so they would look at something like Genesis 3 and say, well, this is to explain why humans are afraid of snakes something like that. So etiological purposes. Uh, why has, is something the way it is? Uh, a couple of examples of this. Uh, <clears throat> this is from a uh, critical commentary in 1910. The book of Genesis is a, uh, that the book of Genesis is a composite work is now so generally recognized that it would be hard to name a writer of importance who denies it. Moving forward to 1950, uh, similarly, a point on which everybody has agreed today is that the real meaning of Genesis is to be sought not so much in the literary form of the whole book as in the literary form of the parts which compose the book. So again, there, there's no overall narrative unity, but you're looking at the individual components. 1964, uh, this is the Anchor Yale, commentary on Genesis. The conclusion, which virtually all modern scholars are willing to accept, is that the Pentateuch was in reality a composite work, the product of many hands and periods. Now notice that all three of these have appealed to consensus. They say, well, everyone does this. You know, every anyone who's anyone <laughs> believes what we do. Uh, so, so there's a lot of peer pressure to, to accept these kinds of conclusions. And in uh, this book, this is a book we read in one of our courses here in the PhD program, these four authors who are evangelicals, they're warning of the dangers of evangelicals applying the higher critical methods of liberals. But what they're pointing out in this book is that that's exactly what we do. And part of it is just for, uh, you, you could call it professional acceptance, there's peer pressure to be accepted by the more liberal scholars out there, maybe by publishers. You, you know, it's almost a career move to, <clears throat> excuse me, to have these things. And so they highlight evangelicals like Daryl Bach, Robert Mounts, Grant Osborne, Craig Blomberg, uh, Trevor Longman III, Craig Evans, and others. I'm saying, hey, even though many of these are conservative evangelicals, they're still using a higher critical method. Uh, and uh, what what they're saying is that the methodology itself isn't neutral. It has an ideology. It has this anti-supernatural ideology behind it. And so <clears throat> the question we're asking is, well, who is on our translation committees? Uh, even if you have, you know, maybe some li liberals and some conservatives, uh, I think their point is you're still going to have this pervasive uh, higher critical thinking, 
uh, when it comes to translation committees. And uh, I'm going to skip some of that, but uh, when it comes to Genesis 3.15, and, you know, I just surveyed a couple of commentaries in Genesis, and, and these are the section headings they have, you know, God announces punishment, the verdict, God's judgments, sentence, judgment and expulsion. And so if you're coming to the, the text with <clears throat> such a negative understanding of what's happening here, like this is something bad, that's going to color your understanding of the verse and your translation of the verse. But in reality, when we think of what has just happened uh, from a narrative standpoint, the purpose of God from Genesis 1, 26 to 28 has just been turned upside down. His image bearers are not ruling the world. Instead, it's a serpent who is ruling the world. And so Genesis 3, 15, that says the promised seed is going to strike the serpent is an incredibly hopeful verse. And if we're continuing as a, a literary unified narrative, then 316, we could expect would continue in that hopeful expectation. Let me see if I can make this a little bigger for everyone. <coughs> Here I have a, a whole bunch of the, some more popular, some less popular translations of Genesis 316. And uh, just to, to show that they all focus on childbirth, they all focus on pain. Actually, there we go. So they're so all talking about pain, labor pains. Only uh, the 1900 King James and New King James, I think correctly, translate this as sorrow. And uh, yeah, the rest are talking about chain, uh, pain. And Virtually all of them are talking about children. Now, the author of Genesis knows how to talk about sons and daughters. He does it plenty in chapter four and five. And here he, he uses the word for sons, uh, not children in general. And, and then uh, moving on to the, the latter part of the verse, basically every translation out there understands the ish as the husband. Uh, but really, I mean, ish uh, just means man uh, in its generic sense, and it can be husband contextually. Uh, so they're they're understanding it as husband here. But what if that's not correct? What if it's actually the ish of 315, uh, the promised seed? And, and I think there's a good argument for that. Uh, also, the, the final clause in 316 is almost always talking about ruling over you, or uh, Net says, you know, controlling your husband, he will dominate you. And uh, I don't think this very well captures what the Hebrew is saying. Um, so that's it for the presentation, but let me uh, just jump over to Logos. Uh, can you see my Logos screen here? I have to change, let me just... On way, uh, we, we, we can see it, but not now. Okay. Was up for a minute. The font was a little bit small. Okay. I'm going to make it bigger here. Okay. Okay. So Genesis three sixteen here, uh, to the man, uh, to the woman, he said, "I'll surely multiply your." Sorrow. Now, uh, if we do, uh, I won't go through it now, but if you were to do a, a lexical search of this word, of etzev, through the Old Testament, it almost never means physical pain. Uh, okay, Jason, possibly... we can't see your uh, uh, Logos screen at all. It's just blank. Oh. Uh, okay, let me try again. Sorry for that. Is that any better? It isn't sharing the log off screen, but the Zoom. Oh. There you go. There we are.
Oh, uh, that's not me. <laughs> oh. Okay, okay, that's Paul's. Okay, uh, that's that's fine. So, so the, the etsev is almost always emotional turmoil, right? So it's not talking about physical pain, and uh, and then in sorrow you shall bring forth sons. It, it's benim, uh, benim, uh, and so. If we are thinking of the story, the flow of the narrative, we don't know what that means yet, but chapter four will explain that in that she has two sons and her, so her conception is multiplied. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I managed, uh, it's uh, with sorrow, I'll multiply your conception, uh, not birth, uh, but conception. And so in chapter four, that's what happens. She has two sons and her sorrow is multiplied because one son kills the other and ends up joining the serpent. Uh, because 316 has laid out that, okay, there's two teams in this narrative. You can be on team God or team serpent. And so her sorrow gets multiplied uh, because she realizes she's not just going to be the mother of the promised seed, which was her hope for Cain uh, when he's born in chapter four, verse one, but she's also the mother of those who join the serpent. And so her, her sorrow will increase for that. And then, uh, you know, this idea of to your husband shall be your desire. Um, the problem, if we take it as a husband, is the, the nature of that desire becomes ambiguous. And if you kind of go through and survey commentaries on Genesis, some will say, well, this is sexual desire, others will say, no, it's desire to rule over the husband, and that's why the husband needs to, to wrestle that rule back from the wife, uh, hence the final clause in 316. But <clears throat> if the object of desire is the son, then the nature of the desire becomes perfectly clear. It's not ambiguous at all. Uh, she's hoping that the promised seed will strike the serpent and restore her rule. Uh, and then uh, the final clause, he shall rule with you. Uh, we have the preposition bait, which any first year Hebrew student will tell you means normally in, with, by, among. And, and so, you know, if a first year student were translating this, they would say, and he, he will rule with you. Now, if we already come to the verse presupposing that it's about problems in marriage uh, and uh, marital conflict, uh, the wife trying to rule over the husband, the husband ruling back, then, then we're duped. Uh, but if we just come to the text and say, well, what does bait normally mean? Then we would end up with something like this, that uh, he will rule with you. Now, some will say, well, there's a, a lexicon, and uh, James, if you want to double click on Mashal. Yeah, uh, and that should take us to hello. Oh, maybe not on yours. But <clears throat> under the lexical entry for Mashal in hello, it will say Mashal plus bait can mean rule over. But then <clears throat> we end up with kind of a circular reasoning happening here because in in that verse they uh, sorry in that entry mashal plus bait they list verses like genesis 118 where they think it means the the sun and the stars will rule over the day and over the night and we look at that and say well why couldn't it just be rule in the day or rule in the night they also list genesis 316 and 4 7 interestingly, which we're saying it doesn't mean over, it means with, uh, which is the normal meaning of bait. Uh, so what we're trying to point out is that while we are to some extent dependent on lexicons, lexicons are sometimes very circular in how they, they go about things. They say, well, bait can mean over, and here's the verse where it means over. And then you say, well, what does bait mean in this verse? And you go to the lexicon, and it, it, so it's, it's completely circular. Um, it's not a, not a great argument. 
for that. So anyways, that's, uh, I, I do want to move swiftly on to 4.7 to um, get to the, the rest of the presentation here. So if you do well, will you not be accepted? Uh, but really, it's, it, it's um, if you do good, good then se'et, uh, this Hebrew word se'et. And that is used in Genesis 49 of Reuben. Now, the, the rest of Genesis will be tracing the line of promise. Who is carrying the promised seed? And from the, the sons of Jacob, you know, Reuben was the firstborn. So naturally, it would have gone to him first, but he was disqualified because he slept with his father's concubine. And so it said he would not have eight. He would, he would not have this preeminence, uh, this status as the firstborn or as the carrier of the seed. And so basically, when Cain grows up in chapter four, uh, the Lord is coming to him saying, if you do tov, uh, if you do good, uh, in other words, if you agree with God about what is good and right in his eyes, then you will be the, either you'll be the promised seed or you'll uh, be in the line, you'll carry the promise. But if not, then we have a problem, <laughs> right? There's this sin uh, that is crouching at the door and the desire of him. Uh, now, sin is a feminine noun and the pronoun attached to desire is masculine. So grammatically, the subject of desire cannot be sin, uh, that you, you would have discordance between the, the gender of the subject uh, and, and, uh, and sin. And so sin can't be uh, desiring. Uh, rather, we can look at all the male characters so far in the story. Who does it make sense that would have the desire? Well, it's not going to be God, uh, so he he's kind of ruled out. It's not going to be Adam because he lost his rule. It can't be Abel uh, because he's also not ruling. And in, in what sense would he or Adam be uh, desiring Cain? And, and so the only male character left is the serpent. And so we, we might look at it this way. Back in 4.1, when Eve gave birth to, to Cain, she said, I've given birth to a man, an ish. Uh, so it's the same word used back in 3.16. And, uh, and so I think that is an expectation, a, a hopeful expectation that Cain is the promised seed of 3.15. But instead... When he grows up, he has this choice. Uh, God comes to him and, and he has this choice. And he's warning Cain in 4.7 that uh, sin is this crouching one at the door, the crouching one being the serpent. And its desire, uh, his desire is for you because you will rule with him. And... So what it's saying is, is that Cain is kind of there in the middle. Uh, the woman has a desire for him to be the promised seed. The serpent has a desire to, to deceive him and have him rule the world with the serpent. And that when you kind of go through the rest of the biblical narrative, that's kind of what's happening. Uh, when you get to someone like Pharaoh trying to wipe out the male line of Israel, you get to... Uh, Haman, uh, trying to wipe out the Jews. You get to Herod, trying to uh, massacre the infant males. Uh, all of these are ruling with the serpent, and they are opposed to the line of promise, uh, trying to deceive. Uh, and if they can't deceive, then they, they try to kill them. And so when you get to the New Testament and John the Baptist comes on the scene and, and says to the Pharisees, hey, you, you brood of vipers. Well, literally that's saying you offspring of serpents. And so if we're following the, the narrative right from Genesis, we immediately know, oh, those Pharisees, they're, <laughs> they're ruling with the serpent. They're the bad team. Uh, they're going to try to 
deceive and or kill the promised seed, uh, which is exactly what they end up doing uh, with the cross. And so it, it kind of flows as a whole narrative that there's always this uh, element of ruling with the serpent uh, against God and against uh, those who hope in the promise seed, those who share the desire of the woman. And then I think history also bears this out because we, you know, the, the norm for human history is rule by tyranny. And I would suggest that in Genesis, we have two different kinds of rule. The rule of God's image bearers is one that brings blessing and care and provision. But the rule of serpent, of the serpent, is one that rules by domination, by oppression. And really, that is what we see uh, with rare exception uh, throughout human history. And so when we look around even today and say, you know, why is it that the worst people always seem to rise to power? Well, it's because they're ruling with the serpent and they have the serpent's style of rule. And so I, I think human history also bears out uh, the, the uh, let, me, let me say it this way, the, what we observe in reality corresponds to the story of the Bible. Uh, and so how does this all connect to premillennialism? Well, it's this desire uh, to rule. Okay, back in 316, I, I was talking about this a little bit earlier, but the story is expecting this point. Uh, and and I'll, I'll wrap it up with this, but the story is expecting a point where there's a resurrection of those who share the woman's desire and they rule with the promised seed. And so it's all kind of going toward this millennial kingdom, uh, toward Revelation 20, where the serpent is finally struck. He's out of the picture, no longer ruling the world. And once again, God's image bearers are, are ruling the world. And um, and that's not happening now, uh, contrary to what many of our covenantal brothers and sisters would argue. Uh, I would argue it is yet future. So I think that's all for now. I've probably done enough talking, but uh, let me turn it over for any questions. Yeah, Jason. Um, I have a question regarding, I don't know if you heard about uh, Bill Barrick. He used to be a teacher at the, the Master uh, University or Master Seminary. And uh, he did a lecture a few years ago. It was the first time that I heard something like that. He made the link between Genesis, Genesis 316 and 417. And he, and he, the translation that he proposes, and if you do not well, if you do not do well, a sin offering is crouching at, at, at your door, at the door. And uh, it was the first time that I heard about that translation. And uh, I don't know if, anyway, uh, I was surprised because for him, the links that he made with Genesis 3.16, when he says, uh, in pain you will, bro uh, you will bring forth children, for him, there's a way out or there's a so, sort of a, yeah, sort of way out saying, even though you have pain and sorrow, it will bring children. And he makes a connection with Genesis 4.17 saying, even though you might do something bad, you might sin. Well, you know what? There's a sin, sin offering uh, crouching at your door. So I was surprised by that, but I wanted to know if you ever heard about that uh, option. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's... Um... The chatat can, mm -hmm. can mean either sin or sin offering. So that, that's a great point. And, and context tells us which it would be. And so my, my question for those who take that view is how would a sin offering fit the flow of the narrative at that point? And, and so that's kind of the step of validation. You know, how do we validate an interpretive option such as the one that uh, this gentleman has proposed is how does it fit the flow of the narrative? And if they can make a good case for that, then then I, I'd be inclined to say, okay, let, let's do it. Uh, but if not, um, then we have a, tr a problem. Now, definitely 4.7 is 
in Hebrew, the grammar is very difficult. Like everybody agrees with that. It, it's super awkward. Uh, you have this disagreement in gender <laughs> of, of various words, and it's it's very hard to translate. So right now the translations are basically a train wreck <laughs> when they, they go to it and they say, uh, and, and I've had professors who are on Bible translation committees and they say, you know, sometimes when you can't figure it out, you just look at other translations and say, hey, what have other people done? <laughs> So you end up with this um, sounding board uh, in a small room. Uh, groupthink, you end up yeah. with groupthink. So, well, thank you. Yeah, that's a good, a good question. Okay, thank you. Jason, Kevin, Super, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I'm a bivocational pastor in Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> um, I, I am not a Hebrew expert, but when you say that he will rule over you or with you in uh, Genesis 3.16, it appears to be feminine singular. With the logic that you're saying, uh, and I, I appreciate this, I'm looking forward to reading thoroughly your, your paper, um, wouldn't it be, you would think, plural? and not feminine even I, and again i'm asking not instructing here <laughs> sure yeah 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 well i think it's because the start of verse 16 it says he said to the woman and so he, he's speaking directly to her saying this is in your future so so i think that's that's why we could explain the feminine pronoun at the end of uh, he will rule with you and, and the you is feminine. So he's directing it very specifically to her, not mm -hmm. to the human race in general or something like that. That's right. Now okay. we can get we can get there theologically because all who share the woman's hope for right. the promised seed will be there as well. Right. So okay. you, you can get there for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for the question. He said this, I just missed it. Um, the sin is feminine. Um, how did that, what did you say about that? Yeah, so in 4.7, sin is a feminine noun and attached to the word desire is a masculine pronoun. So the desire of him or, or his desire can't be a reference to sin. In other words, all the translations that are saying, uh, they translate it as if sin is desiring Cain. That, that doesn't work grammatically because there's disagreement in gender. So it has to be a masculine something that is doing the desiring. Thanks for the question. Yeah, and so you would say that's the serpent? Yeah, by by process of elimination and and just by by logic, uh, it makes sense because the serpent is currently at that point ruling the world, and he's enticing Cain to rule the world with him in his style. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. So then, the sin crouching at the door. That has to be the serpent. I would say the crouching one is definitely the serpent. And, and the word sin, that's an anomaly. Like everyone who looks at that says, how does that fit grammatically? Uh, I'm almost inclined to take it appositionally uh, as if he's saying like, sin, a crouching one is at the door. <laughs> and uh, but but it, it's hard no matter what interpretation or, or uh, translation you take it, it, it's a mess uh, that verse grammatically How then do you explain the the last part of the verse in four seven? You shall rule with him. 
how, how does that work out? You should rule with it. You will rule with it. Yes, uh, I, I would say it, it's a, well, first of all, it's a disjunctive clause. And I would argue it's a causal or explanatory disjunctive, meaning that because would be an acceptable way to put that. So his desire is for you because you will rule with him. Uh, or yeah, yeah, because you will rule with him. And so the serpent is desiring Cain because Cain will further the serpent's rule over the earth. And then there's a question in the chat uh, from Paul. Is there another spot in the Hebrew Bible where the word sin is used in reference to a personal being, Satan, or someone else? That's a good question, and I haven't looked into that. But uh, based on this question, I will take a look. Thank you for that. Good. Well, anything else? And uh, Paul, if you're still there, we, we still can't hear you. <laughs> we can see your chats, though. <laughs> How about now? Can you hear me? No, no nothing. Okay. <laughs> Well, Jason, this has just been uh, excellent. I'm I'm looking forward to to going through your paper, and uh, I think that uh, you know you've opened up uh, a lot of things here. Uh, are there other men that have written on this particular position that you've taken? Yes, uh, but it's not published anywhere reputable. Uh, let me share my screen very briefly this okay uh, teach me the bible.com uh, this is david klingler's website he's my professor he's the head of the bible exposition phd program and under resources we have books and articles and he has written uh, this article on Genesis 3, 16, 4, 1, and 4, 7. And, and what I've tried to do, now he doesn't connect it to premillennialism. Uh, that's not his purpose, but he has an extremely grammatically detailed, like highly, highly technical <laughs> uh, summary of these verses. And so what I've tried to do in my presentation is summarize all, all that technical stuff and then connect it to premillennialism and, and show how right from early Genesis, uh, the Bible is looking for a premillennial conclusion. Well, that, that's always a good question because, you know, people ask, well, how is it that all the Bible translations are wrong and, and uh, nobody else is thinking this? You know, it's, it's kind of only you. <laughs> and, uh, and that kind of goes back to the higher critical approach that that basically everyone's taking it and you end up with this kind of group think and well somebody has to uh, break that mold a little bit and say well here are what the words really mean uh, it should be very concerning to us that in genesis 3 16 to get a translation like niv or even nasb a little bit more literal they have to change the meanings of four words right so they change conception to birth now they're related but they're not the same thing and they change sorrow, emotional turmoil, to physical pain. They change sons to children, and they change with to over. <laughs> so, so it, it should concern us uh, that they have to change the meanings uh, to arrive at that translation. Alan Ross once made the comment that uh, he was on a Bible translation committee, and he said, so we have determined that this is the word of the Lord, by a vote of five to four. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> uh, 
I don't know if you answered this anywhere or if um, this question is going to make any sense, but um, do you think that any, you, you made the argument that like, basically we're looking forward to the kingdom and that was projected from like Genesis, right? From um, Genesis 3. Um, and then you also made the argument that the those that rule are basically, or not those that rule, not all of them, but most of those that rule are doing so under the influence of the serpent would you say that there's any that do it under the influence of the lord or is it just kind of like we we have to wait for the the coming kingdom for that that kind of perfect or more ideal rule um to be to be found yeah that and, and that's kind of the question about who is an image bearer and what is an image bearer supposed to do? Because, you know, is it is the Bible a story about a whole bunch of image bearers, like all those who, who join the hope of the woman? Or, or is it about a single image bearer, Christ, who in Colossians 1 is the perfect image of God the Father? And when he, uh, and, and like in the New Testament, it speaks of believers as being con in the process of being conformed to the image of Christ. So we're not there but we're on the way. And then when we are in our resurrection bodies, I, I assume there's a, a huge jump in our image bearing capacity. And then we, we rule with Christ during the millennium. So I would say it's, yes, we're definitely looking forward to that time in the millennium. Uh, that said, is there occasionally a, a great and godly ruler? Yes, uh, but it's definitely not the norm and it's quite rare. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Okay. Just curious. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. Are you familiar with Charlie Clough's biblical framework by chance? No. No, I'm not. Okay. I'm finally taking the class. I've gone through it independently a couple times, but uh, what you're presenting, if true, you know, fits really well with some of those early themes of Genesis 1 through 11 in God setting things up. So it would, I guess what I'm saying is it would make sense for this to be another kind of piece ingrained in early creation that transcends to the rest of history uh, with ramifications. So uh, definitely interested in looking more at this personally. Sure. That, yeah, that's great. I, I mean, the connection from the beginning to the Bible to the end of the Bible, it, right. it should be clear, right? And, and I think this drives a very clear picture of, of where it's going, where, where the story is headed. Yeah. Hi, Jason. Anthony Driesen. We met in Iowa last month. So yeah, I missed, yeah. Uh, hey, I missed your your reading here as I'm teaching, but uh, yeah. So I, I'm just I've been thinking about this for for about a month, not constantly, obviously, but uh, it's come up a few times just in various conversations. So uh, I appreciate the the dialogue here, and I think it's uh, definitely an interesting topic that comes up in several different facets. Like one, even talking about like comp from a complementarian passage, you know, a guy says, you know, yeah, my wife's just trying to subdue my authority and all this other stuff. So uh, I, I, I've never thought that like reading through Genesis. And then I, I, you know, I just appreciate how this kind of ties some of those uh, pieces together. It seems to make sense grammatically. I'm not a Hebrew grammar expert, but uh, it, it's interesting how many uh, problems it, it can potentially solve here. So yeah, yeah, just want to say appreciate it, and, and it has come up. So, great. Yeah. Well, well th thank you. Good to see you again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and actually, on Anthony's point about you know complementarianism, if Genesis three sixteen really were about this domination and rule but between husband and wife then you would kind of expect that to show up in the narrative somewhere 
And while there's marital conflict in Genesis and other places, it's usually about having children, or <laughs> right? Uh, and never does it rise to the level of a wife trying to usurp her husband's authority. You have to wait all the way until Jezebel in First and Second Kings, where where that actually happens. And so you would, uh, uh, if it's indeed a unified meta narrative, you you would expect uh, the problem to show up regularly. And and really, if it's about the promised seed instead and his rule, that shows up immediately in Genesis four, where Cain joins the serpent and then kills Abel, uh, who who would. Uh, then be the carrier of the promise at that point, uh, and then later replaced by Seth. So thank you for that, Anthony. Okay, Paul has posted something in the chat. Have I looked into rabbinical commentaries? A 13th century rabbinical commentary uh, calls, uh, understand sin as Satan. That that might be very interesting. I've, I've never looked into that particular commentary. But uh, yeah, that's that's interesting. All right, and Philip right. is uh, heading out. Thank you, Philip. Thank you for joining. So, Paul, do you normally go for about an hour? Is that kind of the, the norm? Okay, Paul is asking, do I have a blog or podcast? I do not, but my professor does. That's the Teach Me the Bible website I was sharing earlier. I'll, I'll put it in the, the chat. Uh, teach me the Bible.com. They have a, a top-rated podcast i think it's in the top one percent and they're uh, getting it on christian tv and and he walks through the, the story of the bible at a high level and then he also does book by book exposition and uh, gives a, a pretty good overview of, of what we're kind of doing in the phd program at dallas seminary okay and paul says um we typically wrap up right about now so, okay, last chance for questions, and uh, and then we can wrap things up. Okay, Paul, looks like do you send so... a link where do you send a link where we can uh, uh, download this video or uh, share it? Sure, I'll upload it to YouTube afterwards. Uh, that would be from Paul. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have access to the recording, but but Paul seems pretty good with all, all the techie stuff, uh, and he says he'll upload it to YouTube afterwards. So good, good. Well, just a, a huge thank you, uh, all of you, for being here, for hearing this out, and <laughs> not not chewing me out uh, too hard. Uh, thank you, Paul, for having me. I really appreciate it, and it's been a, a great time. So thank you all very much. I appreciate it.